Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I hope you're well. My name is Alex, and this is Slumber Time Podcast. Today we'll be trying something a bit different, basically just like we do every week. I've mostly been looking at literature or my own pieces recently, and I've even looked at giving advice. I've also done a more standard podcast about memories I've had. Each one has been different than the last, and today will be too. The main reason for me doing this podcast is for me to express myself in different ways and show the types of things that I'm interested in in hopes that others will find inspiration from them. I would like nothing better than for people to cling to some of the things that have been said on this podcast, and hopefully it will help them in different ways. That's why I want to share another interest of mine today, science. I still imagine scientific articles fall under literature, so it still seems appropriate for this channel. That's basically my way of saying that I just want to talk about this in detail. Of course, there are some great YouTube channels online that cover these topics in very professional and impressive ways. I likely won't be able to match their quality, and this is a podcast, so the video will be as basic as it gets. So that's why I would recommend Kyle Hill, especially. Uh, I even enjoy Vsauce and Adam Savage, of course. Today, though, I would like to share some of the more interesting scientific facts that I have learned and share them here. They're ones that I haven't heard many others discuss in so much detail, so I might be able to add an interesting twist to it. I'm by no means a scientist, but I am a hobbyist and have a degree in mathematics. So here are some of the coolest things that science has to offer, in my opinion. First off, have you ever heard of space quakes? This is one of the newest things I learned about and immediately was intrigued. Basically, when plasma from space comes in contact with our magnetic field outside our atmosphere, the magnetic field reverberates as this plasma basically bounces up and down on it, thus creating a shock wave and has the equivalent energy of a magnitude 5 or 6 earthquake. This will then cause interference with signals and can also like disrupt uh, radio waves or even GPS. It's like an EMP, basically. The thing is, this has happened before, and it was even recorded in 2007 when jets of plasma from the solar wind hit Earth. Solar wind basically means that there are very energized particles that are really hot being shot from the sun. There was so much energy in them that at that time it even made it from the magnetic field about 30,000 kilometers away, past the Kármán line, which is about 100 kilometers up, through our atmosphere to the ground. The reason I find this so cool outside just the name Spacequake itself is the way that the plasma and the magnetic field interact. The fact that the plasma bounces up and down on the magnetic field and causes that much energy is amazing to me. Moreover, there's a thing called a starquake. That is basically the same as an earthquake, but much, much more intense. One estimate is that the energy released can be equivalent to a magnitude 32 quake. Something completely unbelievable on Earth. This basically occurs on neutron stars when there's an extremely sudden change in the core that, paired with the extreme gravity, moves it into more of a perfect sphere. This then releases so much gamma radiation that it would have caused a mass extinction on Earth if the star were within 10 light years of us. That brings me to the next point, and this is what started the entire wiki dive that I went into. It's about a star called Magnetars. If there's a space quake in one ten thousandth of a second, a magnetar might produce more energy than the sun has emitted in the last hundred thousand years, according to NASA. Honestly, this is probably the coolest star that I've ever heard of. It's a type of neutron star with an insanely large magnetic field. The reason that I find this so cool is because there was recently a study about one possible formation of the magnetars. According to Paul Sutter on Live Science, I, I'd like to read what uh, he wrote. One merger scenario to potentially generate an FRB, uh, aka fast radio burst, is the merger of a white dwarf with a neutron star. 
Both neutron stars and the white dwarfs are exotic types of dead remnants of once normal stars. A white dwarf is the planet-sized leftover core of a star like our sun, a lump of carbon and oxygen slowly cooling off as the cosmic age is progress. A neutron star is like a white dwarf, but more so. It's a leftover core of a much more massive star, composed almost entirely of neutrons compressed into a ball no bigger than a city. Since stars are often born in pairs, it's not crazy to think that, after enough time, both stars in a system could die, leaving behind their particular kind of dead cores, and that slowly, 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 those dead lumps could circle closer together, finally reaching a critical point at which their gravitational interaction overwhelms everything, sending the stellar corpses to spiraling inward toward each other and their doom. Right at the cusp of their final collision, one of two scenarios could play out. In one case, the white dwarf can puff up, letting the outer tendrils of its atmosphere escape and funnel down to the neutron star. In the other, the extreme gravity of the neutron star completely shreds the white dwarf and its tattered stellar corpse rains down on its heavier, denser sibling. In either case, a tremendous amount of mass transfers to the white dwarf and onto the neutron star, and that's where the fun really begins, according to new research. The scientists behind the new research want to know whether a merger between a white dwarf and a neutron star could be just right to trigger the escalation of an extreme magnetic field. At first, the infalling material, whether stripped from the white dwarf or made of the torn up white dwarf itself, spirals onto the neutron star. As it falls, it accelerates the rotation of the neutron star, like a grown-up pushing on a merry-go-round at the playground to the delight and horror of the kids on it. Soon, the neutron star is spinning faster than the blades of your kitchen blender. This spiraling takes the surrounding magnetic field and spins it up on itself, coiling like a snake ready to strike. But the flow of matter onto the neutron star isn't smooth at all. It's incredibly turbulent and chaotic. Tiny little kinks and warps in the magnetic field stretch, twist, and grow, causing the magnetic field to feed back on itself in a dynamo mechanism, tapping into the powerful energies unleashed in the collision of the white dwarf and the neutron star to power up a magnetic field stronger than anything else in the universe. At last, the magnetar is born at least according to this new theory. Isn't that one of the coolest things? You basically have two stars colliding into each other and then creating a new type of star. Scientists so far have uh, found 30 magnetars so far, and that's not the end either. There's another type of neutron star, which is called a pulsar. These are the most common types, and basically it's a star that emits a lot of radiation from their magnetic poles. They're called pulsars because when they spin, it might not be just like north to south poles. So when we see it from farther away and while it moves in such a way so that we see the radiation, it's not always going in the same direction. It makes it seem to us as if the radiation is starting and stopping anytime we see it, making it look like the star is pulsing radiation out. The reason I bring this up is that there are six known stars that are both magnetars and pulsars. Isn't that the coolest thing? By now, you might have already taken a look at the picture I have up about the different types of stars. I'll link to it in the description, but it's the clearest explanation of what types of stars turn into what other types of stars. I'll also point out that uh, others I have talked to got a little confused by the numbers listed next to the names. Uh, that's in regards to the solar mass of the star. That M doesn't mean million. Basically, the mass of one of our suns, or actually the mass of 330,000 Earths. If a star is within that range of solar masses, it is then going to follow that life of a star. Those that are between 8 and 40 or 50 solar masses are going to be neutron stars. And if it gets any more massive, then it can become a black hole. Our sun, for example, if you look there closer to the bottom, will follow the path of a low mass star, which will then become a red giant and likely become a white dwarf unless it gains a lot more mass before then. 
it will eventually become a black dwarf, but there's actually no known black dwarfs in the universe because the universe hasn't been around long enough for all the heat from the white dwarf to be completely gone. On a similar note, the death of stars is a really interesting point too. As many know, stars will burn hydrogen to produce heat and light. Over millions of years, it will eventually run out of hydrogen, then will move to helium, then to carbon, and all of its other layers. It will basically go through the periodic table, but once it hits iron, that's when things get really interesting. Stars produce their energy through fusion, but iron is an element that cannot really give energy to fusion. When you try to fuse iron, it will take in more energy than it will let out. For our sun, it means it will likely just die a peaceful death and just turn into a white dwarf. For the really massive stars, when the burning stops, the outer parts of the star fall into the center. With the gravity of these stars, that in turn will have a lot of mass and energy being pulled to the center hit the iron core at near the speed of light, then will explode the star into a type 2 supernova. You can't say that science isn't cool. I could probably keep going on and on. And don't get me started on stellification, uh, the making of stars. All I'll say is look up what happens if you put a black hole into a gas giant like Jupiter. You'll be pretty surprised at what might happen. Now, this is just the basic information about stars. This is what I found in some basic research and some information I wanted to share. For how all of this works with a more detailed explanation of everything that's happening, you'll have to do the research yourself. I personally think it's fun to do some wiki dives in relation to these types of topics. And again, check out how the heat from black holes can turn Jupiter into a star. It's so cool. So yeah, that's all for today. I have another science topic that I wanted to discuss alongside this, but it in no way relates to this one. So as a last minute uh, change, we'll have a shorter episode today and I'll save that for next time. However, I hope that this length is less daunting to want to watch all the way through and I'll be happy to answer any questions I get if I know the answer. I'll also try to point you in the right direction for it if I do not. Anyway, just remember, we're here, and we're listening.